Hello, and welcome to A History of Jazz, a podcast dedicated to exploring jazz history one record at a time. I'm your host, Arik Devins. So I expected this episode to be out a couple weeks ago, but I had dental surgery, and it took a little bit longer to recover than I expected. So apologies for the wait. Uh, I'm back, and I'm super excited to jump into this episode. All right, so today we're going to go into a lot more detail about one of the artists we looked at in our last episode, clarinetist Wilbur Sweatman. One of the things that makes me really excited about doing this podcast is that I have the space to talk about people like Sweatman, who were incredibly famous in their own day, but have been largely forgotten over time. And it's so great that I get to take a look back at them and, and shed a little more light on who they were. As I tell his story today, I'll be playing some of the songs that he released in 1918. All right, so as I mentioned in our first episode, it is highly unlikely that jazz was invented in New Orleans. There were simply too many places where similar things were happening, too much music around the country. But because that's the narrative that mostly gets talked about, a lot of early jazz pioneers like Sweatman are overlooked because they don't fit into a New Orleans-based narrative. Additionally, uh, as I also mentioned in our first episode, all music recording was acoustic until 1925, which means that when we listen to these early jazz artists like Sweatman, who did most of their recording pre-1925, we are therefore only getting a vague approximation of what these artists actually sounded like. There was just too little range to the recording technology, and so many of the instruments they used just didn't, didn't record well. And so we have to kind of extrapolate from the recordings we have with contemporary descriptions of live performances and the knowledge of which instruments were being used to create a sense in our minds of what the artists actually sounded like. The other thing is that in this era, rec recording companies had all the power and they tightly controlled what was being made. They would decide what songs to record, what instruments should be played, who should play them, everything. And this was especially bad for African-American musicians who were treated uh, the worst of anyone. One of their primary tactics was to strong-arm artists into selling the publishing rights to the songs to the record companies. So they would tell artists, we're only going to put out your records if you agree to sell us the rights. This allowed them to effectively pay themselves twice, once when selling the original record and then later for the song royalties. Sweatman was wrapped up in all of this. In fact, on top of that, he was told by his recording company for the records we're going to hear today that what they wanted from him was to sound like the original Dixieland Jazz Band. So on top of everything else, we're getting something that was intended to be an imitation of somebody else. So taking all of that into account, Wilbur Sweatman is a fascinating character. He was one of the first African-American musicians to regularly perform with European-American musicians. He was the first African-American musician to record in the USA with a racially mixed group in 1916 for Emerson. He was one of the first African-American musicians to become a real star nationally. And he was likely one of the first African-American artists to appear in vaudeville without wearing blackface or special costumes. All right, before we jump into his story, let's start listening to the songs he released in 1918 with a track called Regretful Blues. <laughs> Okay, so Wilbur Sweatman was born February 7th, 1882 in Brunswick, Missouri, which is about 90 miles away from Kansas City. His first instrument was the piano, which he learned from his older sister, and then he later taught himself the violin and then the clarinet, which was his primary instrument. 
When he was young, his father abandoned the family, and he was raised primarily by his mother, who owned a barber shop but also ran a boarding house in their home, which meant that Wilbur was introduced to all different kinds of people, including traveling musicians. Additionally, Brunswick was only about 60 miles from Sedalia. As I mentioned in our first episode, that's where virtually all the ragtime musicians were. So Sweatman was ideally placed to be hearing all of the new African-American music that was happening. Now, at this time in American history, there were very few opportunities in the entertainment business for African-American musicians. If you were a pianist, you were usually playing in a bar, maybe a whorehouse. For other instruments, it was almost always with a circus sideshow or a traveling minstrel act. If you were a young person, there was sometimes work as something called a pick act. Now, pick was short for pickaninny, which is a racist term for stereotypical African-American youth. And to quote jazz critic Marshall Stearns, no doubt the practice provided a fine schooling and developed a youngster's ability, as well as teaching him show business, but the profits were one way. The employer was white and adult, while the pick was Negro and a child, so picks never got rich. It was child labor, theatrical style. Many dancers started as picks only because it was one of the ways for a Negro to get into show business. Sweatman got his start in a group called the Pickaninny Band in the mid-1890s, and this was a touring band of young African-American musicians. One newspaper from that period described them as, Probably the most attractive feature of the Apple Carnival Parade was Professor N. Clark Smith's Pickaninny Band of Wichita. Sousa, so it is said, calls this band the best kid band in the world. Sousa heard the band play in Wichita last summer, and he ought to know what he's talking about. All right, let's hear another song from Sweatman in 1918, Everybody's Crazy About the Doggone Blues. So by 1901, Sweatman had left home and moved to St. Louis and was making a living playing dances. He joined a concert band as the orchestra leader, which made him at 20 the youngest orchestra leader on the road, and the band primarily played circuses. In those days, African-American bands would often play in marches to announce the coming of a circus and then play as part of the parade. They weren't allowed to play in the Big Top itself, which was a segregation that lasted until the late 1970s. African-American musicians often played with circus tours in the summer because theaters and dance halls in this era didn't have air conditioning and would be forced to close due to the extreme heat. So it was a way for musicians to have round-the-year work. By the end of 1902, Sweatman joined a group called Mahara's Minstrels, which was a band led by someone we talked about last time, blues legend W.C. Handy. And this is where he began to play first two and then finally three clarinets simultaneously, which was his primary vaudeville gimmick. As jazz writer Lawrence Gushy says, Musical acts were pretty much obliged to have gimmicks, such as elaborate, often exotic costumes or peculiar instruments, or to present their acts in a kind of choreography. The lesson that had to be learned was that vaudeville audiences were not there to be edified, as at a concert, but to be entertained. And music without words is not that entertaining by itself. This aspect of vaudeville was alive and well when dance bands began to appear on the vaudeville stage and found themselves obliged to impersonate Arabs, Eskimos, soldiers, sailors, and what have you. So you needed some kind of gimmick to make yourself known, and this was Sweatman's, but he only played multiple clarinets for vaudeville and minstrel shows and never did so on any of his recordings. Speaking of which, let's hear another one of those recordings. This one is a song made famous by the original Dixieland jazz band, Darktown Strutter's Ball. <laughs> ¶¶ 
By 1903, Sweatman had left St. Louis and was living in Minneapolis and had formed a new band. And this band was quite likely the first African-American instrumental group to record their music. Now, they weren't recorded on vinyl. That wasn't how it worked at that, this point. These were released on wax cylinders. And sadly, there are no remaining playable copies. Wax cylinders were a very expensive and time-consuming way to record and unfortunately also fairly fragile. You would bring a band into the studio, record them, and as they were recording, it would cut the cylinders. So you would only get as many copies as you recorded at the time you brought the musicians into the studio. If the record turned out to be popular and you wanted more copies, you actually had to bring the band back into the studio to make them. So it's a, it, was, it was not a particularly efficient way to make music. But either way, even though we don't get to hear this, it's still crazy fascinating to me that he was recording at such an early time period. By 1908, he had moved to Chicago. Now, as I mentioned in our first episode, Chicago was a hotbed for African-American entertainment. And specifically, there was a black theater and cabaret area on South State Street called the Levy District. And these were some of the first places that African-American entertainment was being produced for African-Americans, which ultimately led to African-American vaudeville. Sweatman got the job of, as the musical director of a theater called The Grand, and that was his new home base for a clarinet, piano, and drums trio that he was in. Unfortunately, we don't have any recordings of this trio, but contemporary writers who heard them claimed that they were playing jazz as early as 1908, which was long before the Creole band came t- from New Orleans. In 1909, he was actually asked to be the conductor for the National Orchestra of Nicaragua, But the same day that that offer and the tickets to Nicaragua arrived was the day that a coup overthrew President Jose Santos Zelaya. When Sweatman heard the news, he apparently began to play a song called Take Your Time, and his landlady asked why he was playing such an outdated song, and he said, if the South American government wants me, they'll have to send their band to Chicago. At this point, Sweatman's trio was the only African-American group playing in a European-American club in Chicago, and they were playing at a mob-owned venue which was later the location of at least one hit. Let's hear another song from Sweatman in 1918, Goodbye Alexander. In 1911, Wilbur Sweatman began his 20-year career in vaudeville with a show in Louisville, Kentucky. Sweatman was different from pretty much every other vaudeville act. Vaudeville as a form of entertainment catered to the lowest common denominator. In most cases, it was a theater of racial stereotypes. Jewish Americans and African Americans would portray offensive stereotypes of themselves. Even the Creole band with Freddie Keppert that I mentioned in our first episode presented a plantation act. In fact, even European Americans in vaudeville had to play as so-called rubes, that is, down-home simpletons who were easily fooled. It was like everyone in vaudeville played a role, a very stereotyped role. Sweatman, on the other hand, appears to have performed in a simple suit, with no blackface, and with no plantation act. His only gimmick, as I mentioned earlier, was playing multiple clarinets. This was unheard of in the industry. The industry at this point was completely controlled by the booking office, which was called the UBO, and was better known by the artists as the Syndicate. They hired everyone for every theater in the circuit, they planned all the bills, they set all the salaries, and if you disobeyed them, you were blacklisted. They even decided what songs an act would play on a particular night. As the famous singer Sophie Tucker explains, Between the matinee and the night show, the blue envelopes began to appear in the performer's mailboxes backstage. Inside would be a curt order to cut out a blue line of a song or piece of business. Sometimes there was a suggestion of something you could substitute for the material the manager ordered out. There was no arguing about the orders in the blue envelopes. They were final. You obeyed them or quit. And if you quit, you got a black mark against your name in the head office, and you didn't work on the Keith circuit anymore. Life in vaudeville was hard for everyone, but it was especially hard for African-American artists. They had segregated dressing rooms at best, 
They made less money, they were facing open hostility, racist comments, fines, and unreasonable punishments for the smallest offenses. And even more upsetting, vaudeville theater owners were wary of any African-American act becoming successful. They were afraid that a successful act would draw more African-American customers and push away potential European-American customers. Therefore, they didn't book a lot of African-American acts, which made it very hard for anyone to get noticed. But even if someone did manage to get noticed, they would have dates canceled for fear of attracting too many African-American customers to the theater. All right, let's hear another song from 1918 now with Those Drafton Blues. In 1912, Sweatman and his wife had relocated to Harlem in New York City. He was still playing in vaudeville, including at big theaters in New York. By 1916, Sweatman was invited to the studios of the Emerson Phonograph Company and recorded what some people think is the actual first jazz record. So among the tracks he recorded that day was one of his own composition. It's called The Down Home Rag. Now, it's not as long as some of the other songs from this period, Emerson was a pretty small company, and they didn't have the resources of Victor or Columbia, so they made 10-inch records, which only had a playtime of about a minute and a half per side. But this record came out two months before the original Dixieland Jazz Band even arrived at Ryzen Weber's restaurant. So I'll let you decide if this was the real first jazz record or not. It was definitely not labeled as jazz at the time. So here it is, Down Home Rag. at 1917 and the immediate success that the original Dixieland Jazz Band had, which caused two of the smaller record companies, Edison and Pathé, to want to release their own jazz music. Edison chose the Frisco Jazz Band, who we heard from last episode. Pathé, on the other hand, re- recorded the Wilbur Sweatman song we heard last time, Joe Turner Blues. Pathé at this point was new to the American market, and due to patents that were held by the big guys, Columbia and Victor, they had to make their records somewhat differently. So instead of using the traditional lateral cut cylinders, they used vertical cut cylinders, which was a little bit of a problem because not a lot of people had a way to play those back. Pathé also made different size records. They would sell in different sizes. And for this reason, they would start with a master cylinder, which would then be copied with something called a pantographic process, which was basically a way to play the record and trace it and then record at different sizes. Unfortunately, this introduced a mechanical bass rumble that was not audible on the equipment of the time. No one could hear it, but with the modern playback equipment we have now, if you play one of their records, you can hear it. It's pretty noticeable. Pathé from 1917 to 1920 had the first major catalog of African-American singers and musicians, and they recorded more African-American artists during this time than all the other companies combined. They promoted Sweatman pretty aggressively, including with this copy. (laughs) ¶¶ 
Wilbur Sweatman, vaudeville artist and favorite, who can play a clarinet and even two clarinets at the same time in a style all his own, and from which exudes both mirth and melody, is the owner of a jazz band, which has out all others. Devotees of the modern dance in the 400, an upper society set of New York City, want nothing else to dance by. Sweatman's jazz band is the sensation of the hour. The word jazz is a Negro-coined word, meaning strange harmonies and pep. Sweatman's band knows its meaning. As a novelty, it is the last word in dance music. So let's hear some more of that last word with 1918's Has Anybody Seen My Corinne? Okay, so as I mentioned, almost all the songs we heard in this episode were released by Columbia. Now, their original jazz band was W.C. Handy, but as I've mentioned, he was really more of a blues artist, and anyway, his records weren't selling as well as the original Dixieland jazz band was. So they hired Wilbur Sweatman, asked him to be their original Dixieland jazz band imitator, and they sold extremely well. All right, we'll finish up this episode with one last song from Wilbur Sweatman. It's called Ringtail Blues, and we'll be back next time to take a look at what else was happening in jazz in 1918. Hope you enjoyed the show. Follow along with the show on Twitter at Jazz History Pod, or check out the website at ahistoryofjazz.com. Every episode, I'll be including a link to a Spotify playlist of all the songs we heard. You can subscribe in iTunes or Overcast or wherever great podcasts can be found. If you want to participate, please leave a rating or a review. You can follow me on Twitter at Daniel Tiger, and I hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs>